So, uh, you know, the, the it has been two weeks I came here, and last Sunday, and this Sunday, the last Sunday and previous Sunday, uh, the same thing happened in the city center, this so-called peace protest. And everybody was dressed in, either dressed in blue and yellow, or they painted themselves blue and yellow. They were carrying something blue and yellow. Everywhere was Ukrainian flag colors. And at night, by the way, big uh, buildings are doing this blue and yellow lightning and everything. So everything is blue and yellow in Europe, obviously. So it got me thinking, like, what the hell? I'm mean, like, I don't remember in 2003, for instance, when Iraqi invasion happened, when Iraqi invasion happened, nobody was dressing in Iraqi flag colors. And I tweeted about this the other day, like nobody dressed in Iraqi flag colors. And one stupid guy said that, you know what? It's not easy to distinguish between all those Arab flags. So that's why actually maybe it didn't happen. Obviously, it's not the reason. <laughs> and I thought how easy it is. Uh, for peace protesters when, you know, their demands are in line with the real politic of their nations. So accordingly, actually, there, there is no, you know, excitement, no euphoria, no, 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 it's not burning. You see, I'm like, it's all serene, super calm. Maybe it's Hamburg, but, uh, you know, Hamburg is not a very exciting place in that sense. But I think all over the world, this, uh, being in the same line with the real politic of the NATO and European countries and United States uh, is, you know, does have an effect on the peace protests. And I do think that now they are being utilized by the real politic. I don't want to go into conspiracy, but I feel like something is cooking and everybody's getting prepared. I'm like, yeah, the, the, the real politic is preparing the crowds for a you know, bigger war or a longer war and so on. This is one part of the story, which, you know, I am so keen to uh, listen what you think about. And the other thing is this sanctions on oligarchs, how politically pathetic is it is. I mean, like you cannot do anything and you do this oligarch, you know, sanctions on oligarchs. And Yanis wrote a piece about this, uh, about the scrutiny of oligarchic money and the Swiss banks and so on. And I, Yanis, I agree with you. I hope this scrutiny uh, takes a broader, uh, goes to a broader scale and they scrutinize all the illegal black money, bl money laundering and all the dictatorship money and so on. But it seems they only do things, they only go beyond the rules when it fits their interest. Because you know, I'm thinking about all this Western civilization, the most, uh, you know, sacred thing is the private property. So how do they legally actually uh, legitimize the fact that they are uh, abducting, the, uh, confiscating the private property of oligarchs in order to reach a political goal? And also this Russian sentiment, I'm like, probably you heard all of this, but has reached some absurd levels. In Zagreb Flarmony, they took out Tchaikovsky film program, Vienna Flarmony, Flarmonic Orchestra uh, canceled the contract with the Russian director uh, in Turkey, by the way. Okay, we have to we have to be the extreme, of course. They pull they're trying to pull out Dostoevsky from the Sura column. So yeah, uh, it, it, it is becoming nonsense. And many people uh, trying to legitimize this anti-Russian sentiment by telling that, I saw that kind of opinions, by telling that uh, 80%, more than 80% of Russians are supporting the war. Okay, my question is, are we going to compromise the remaining 20% or, and also how about the Russians who had to leave the country because of Putin? Uh, and also, how about Duma last week passing a law uh, banning to call this a war, but a special operation? And you can be charged by 15 years if you call the invasion of Ukraine as a war. So these are my points. And I remember 2003 very well because I was one of the uh, two spokespersons of No to War Coalition in Turkey. 
there was this shameless enthusiasm coming from Western countries. And I remember, I don't know if you remember this, but on the day the Iraqi war started, the invasion started, started uh, the Wall Street opening bell was rang by a general as a celebration of the war and the profit of the war. That was shameless. But this time, I think that shameless enthusiasm is replaced by this pride and honor of being on the victim's side. I am not really criticizing the people who are joining these peace protests. I am not for, you know, spotting the hypocrisy there. Okay, you didn't do this for Syrians, now you're doing it for Ukrainians because they are white Christians and so on. Because when people are doing something good in the name of good, it's not nice to you know, uh, curb their enthusiasm. But I think we have to be careful about the, this being utilized in terms of real politics. And so. Well, I know the shame of being a citizen of a country run by a dictator. You know, things are done in your name and you're constantly in this, oh my God, like you know, this really deeply shameful uh, feeling. So I can imagine at least this 20% of the population is in that mood at the moment. So I cannot, I, I don't feel comfortable compromising that. So Brian's Petersburg story and your story come together in my head because this narrative being almost, sec not secretly, but like by an invisible hand, let's say, when the narrative is determined by this invisible hand, when it's adopted by people so enthusiastically, as if it's their own personal uh, free choice, it gets me thinking. Because I remember how things turned around in Turkey uh, when AKP came to power in 2002. Uh, and, and then, like, for five years, it became almost sinful to criticize AKP. It was this weird period. It was embarrassing to be on that side. Because if you are on that side, you were, you know, supporting the army, you're supporting the military coup and so on. It's almost the same today. If you're talking about, uh, you know, NATO, uh, instead of trashing Putin or Russia, that means that you're a Putin lover, whatever, Putin supporter. If you're making a music with the title Petersburg, you are suddenly on Putin's side and so on. Mm -hmm. When the narrative is uh, so, um, how shall I put it? Look, so invisibly determined, there is something fishy going on there. And you were so right about the split of the left, First World War. It is so similar to that because you were, uh, you know, you were attacked personally, Yanis, by you know these people. I was attacked by Turkish, not Turkish actually, from the left. For some reason, suddenly, many people became Putin lovers when you say something like correct, trying to say something correct and objective, you know, you're in quote in crossfire. The most humiliating to, thing that one can do to a people is to equate that people with the dictator. Mm -hmm. So Russians are more yes. than Putin, far more than Putin. Let's not forget that, please, because I really feel for those people who are uh, in excruciating shame and who feel completely helpless. 